Hey, what's up YouTube? My name's Cricky, welcome back to the channel. Here we go. I'll do it. <laughs> right, what I'm doing is making a cardboard air box and he's gonna live in there. And what I'm trying to do is to replace this. This is the stock air box off the Suzuki Bandit 600 and it is officially the ugliest thing on the planet. <laughs> it fell out the ugly tree, hit every branch on the way down, and then ended up on a Suzuki Bandit. <laughs> it's so ugly that Mr. Suzuki gave you a couple of nice shiny covers to go on that bit, just to cover up its ugliness. It's horrible. However, it is a really clever thing, actually. I'm having to run an air box on this bike because I've got CV carbs. If this was a 1200, you can just put pod filters on it. And it runs quite happily, you can set it up, not a problem. Um, but on a 600, that just ain't gonna work. I did look at McCuny to see if they did like a set of flat slide carbs that could be fitted to this, that would make it all work peachy and everything else. They don't, the smallest CC bike, um, they even list anything for that I found, as far as Suzuki's go, is the 750. It seems like you need a bigger displacement to make it work. But this thing, even though it is ugly, it is a very clever piece of kit. Very clever. I've been researching it and looking into it and everything else because I have to run one. Um, and I'm going to make my own, if I'm honest, based on cosmetics. I want it to look nice and I want it to be on show. Because um, it's quite, you know, it's quite a big thing really and it has to live there so you're going to see it. So I want a nice looking one. Um, however, once I started looking into it, there is a ton of stuff going on here like loads. So you can think of an air box as essentially a, an engine, well, an air delivery management system, I suppose, is probably the easiest way to put it, basically. Um, and it, it performs like a number of functions that I'm gonna have to try and mimic if this is gonna run right. So the first thing, it has to filter the air. That's the air filter that lives in there. He's gonna live in there. I'm using the same thing. Um, this is a high flow air filter. So the stock one is more restrictive than this is gonna be, but the stock one also filters out more than that one does. So, you know, there's your first compromise. And just by using that, I would have to reject the carbs anyway to suit it. Um, the second thing is the volume of this thing. You know, it's physical size. How much air can you fit in there? Um, that again is quite important. It was going on about loads of stuff to do with, and I don't get it, I'm not an engineer, I'm not a mechanic, I don't understand this stuff. Um, but it's to do with, um, th this is actually like a resonating chamber as well. It's all to do with fluid, fluid dynamics and volumetric efficiencies and God knows what else. But essentially there's like a pressure wave that is bouncing about in here. Um, and if you were to look at it, it's like a sine wave or something. Um, because of its size and its shape, that pressure wave is kind of timed, so clean filtered air is presented to the carbs uh, in just the right condition for the carbs just to suck it in as they demand it, basically. Um, it's all supposed to be smooth on the inside, this end. However, all the inside of it, it's all rounded corners and stuff you can see in here. There aren't any sharp corners. Mine is going to have some sharp corners um, just because of the way I need to build it. Um, the other thing that is important is um, these things, these little boots. They live here and connect the air box to the carbs. And apparently the height of these is important. That affects your torque and power, the diameter and the shape of them. Um, you can get longer ones. I can't remember which way it is. If it's longer, it increases peak power or influences peak power, something like that. If they're shorter, it's torque. I don't know, it's something like that anyway. Go look it up. I did and then I forgot it. <laughs> the other thing that's important is that hole. So that is the only way that air can get into the, the system once it's all bolted down. And it is that size for a reason. There was one fella I was watching on YouTube. This is why you need to take everything with a pinch of salt if it's on YouTube or anything, because everyone knows everything apparently. Um, but there was one fella who was going on about, well, that's a restriction. Yes, it is, you're quite right. So, if you just drill loads of holes in here, you'll let more air into your air box. And then you can increase the jet size on your carbs. 
That way you've got more air and fuel going into your carbs. So when it goes bang, it's a bigger a bang and you get more power. And all you had to do was drill a whole load of holes in here. <laughs> Don't do that, that's a stupid idea. Um, I think he dynoed his bike first up, then he did his mod, and then he dynoed it again and he lost a third of his power. <laughs> if, put it this way, if it was a good idea, this thing would be peppered as stock. You know, Suzuki would have done it. In fact, probably what they would have done would just be to stick the air box, the, the air filter on like that and run that, because that's about as unrestricted as you're going to get. But they didn't. They put a lid on it with a hole a certain size. So I'm going to be mimicking that as well. I can work out the surface area of that hole and where we punch the louvers in the back of this, we'll get as close to that as we can do. Um, I think we're going to be all right on the volume, although this is going to be a different shape. It is going to have some square corners. If anything, the volume of mine is going to be a little bit bigger than this, but not by much. Um, so as far as I can mimic this, that's what I want to do. Yeah, but it's not easy. It's not easy. Where's my thing? So this is one of the boots that um, lives in the air box. Um, and he basically goes on like that. That groove there is where the plastic on the, the air box actually sits. So that's the, you know, the front face is kind of like that, if that makes sense, of the air box. Um, so I'm just cutting out profiles for the side of it, basically, that I can then marry up to that groove and see what it looks like. And this is kind of what I've come up with. Um, there's an equal gap that runs around here. This is angled the same as that. It kind of goes down so it just clears this bit of the engine. So essentially I'm getting as much volume as I can do in there. The only thing is to get the air box out or the carbs out is a pain. Um, and I'll probably need to decide. Hmm. It is gonna be bloody awkward actually. What I'm thinking of doing is making this section of the air box detachable from this section of the air box, which is how the original one is done anyway. So essentially, this surface here would be flat and it would go straight across. Um, this back bit would seal onto this bit, I think. How will I do that? How would I do that? I want to be able to remove that from that, basically. <laughs> Maybe I don't bother with this top bit. Maybe that's the trick. If he went like that, and this bit just came straight into here. Would that work? It'd be quite nice, because you'd be able to see daylight around there. And to get the air box off, you would basically remove this tail section, undo these clamps here, and all you've got to do is move the air box back by yay amount, so it, it clears the carbs, which we could easily do, it'll come back to there, so that's enough. And then you'll be able to slide the air box out that way, or the front section of it. Maybe that's what I'm doing. And I'll lose this top bit. Um, and I could hide stuff up there as well, couldn't I? Right, okay, I might be doing that. Right, let's um, build the front bit and then see how we go. Thank you. 
center line there for my carbs. How much is that? 85. Right, okay, so um, just the way I'm doing this, just to show you, can you see this? You probably can't. Anyway, we've got four um, carbs sitting here. Uh, the center line of the carbs is gonna be 85 down from the top. Um, and the edge of the carb is going to be 25 in from uh, the side. Um, I've looked at, it's a bit of a silly shape because you see it all sort of dishes in there and it's, it's straighter here. You know, it's a bit, you know, it's, it's, it's not going to be straight because the frame sort of scoops out and I want this to follow the frame when you're sitting, when sitting on it looking down from the top. So I want all this to be flush. So we are going to have to neck this side in a little bit. Um, I know where my carbs is going to go and where the holes would need to be on this. That's easy enough. From the outside of uh, carb one to carb four, that's 300. Um, the air box is going to step out 25 past that just to give me space for the boot. So in total, that's um, 350. Um, so all I've got to do is mimic this side. So basically come in 10 mil on there and then I can use the bit that I chopped out of this side sort of stick him on there, scribe a line round, and we should be able to mimic it pretty closely. At least good enough that I can get some measurements from when we, when we come to doing it in, um, doing it in alley. Right, whilst we're doing this, might as well tell you about the ZZR, because I've done it no favors at all. And it's fun, the troubles that I've got, it's fundamentally changing what I'm thinking of doing in the future basically. <laughs> so we might as well have a yap about it, eh? Um, ZZR, had an engine rebuild and stuff. I put 500 miles on it, I think. Just, I mean, it had new, had a new valve, it had new rings, it had, you know, new bits and doodads. The gearbox ended up getting replaced, various other bits and pieces. Um, but one of the things that I wanted to do was to give it a run up on the dyno and see what power it made initially. Um, and then later on we could start fettling and sorting out the fuel in and various other bits and pieces. And then we'd see how much it made after it had been fettled. So basically I took it down to Krispies. Um, there's a video on it all if you want to go and have a look, see. Um, but we gave it hell on the dyno. <laughs> properly give it out. We had trouble with the carbs. It ended up as the carb needles were sort of sticking, they weren't moving properly, so all that lot had to come apart. But the easiest way to test it all was just to raise it up on the dyno. So in the end, he probably had like 11 runs, and they weren't gentle ones, like at all, on a freshly built engine. <laughs> and I've caused damage to it, basically. I've killed it on the dyno, which is easily done. They blow up on a dyno, all the time. The bike is still running, still makes good power, still got good compression. I've had its lid off, I've checked my valve gaps, I've done the, the cam chain tensioner, I've fitted a manual tensioner because the starter motor alternator chain was clobbering the clutch plate, all that sort of stuff. And fires on the button and it's it's just brilliant. Makes really good power, it's easy to ride, it's not a problem, it's just, it's got that noise. It's got horrible noise to it and I don't like it. Um, so anyway, I got in touch with um, Matt and Andy and I recorded a short video. I don't think I've still got the video. I might do another one, I don't know. Um, just so you can hear what I'm going on about. Um, and I played it to them and I said, you've got a much better trained ear than me because they both know engines inside and out basically. Um, I think Andy used to build them at one point. Um, I said, if you heard this noise, what would you think it is? And, you know, it was obviously in the video. And I got a reply back from Matt saying it sounds like rod knock. 
so I was like, okay, what's Rod not then? <laughs> it sounds quite happy, but you know. <laughs> um, what he thinks might have happened is that a bearing has shifted. Might have happened, we don't really know. Um, the symptoms are that you've got this noise low down, sort of like idle up to 3,200, 3,000, something like that. It's quite pronounced and you can definitely hear it and it's not a nice happy noise. Um, and then you get above that and the noise disappears. And he thinks it could be rod knock and that's basically when a, when a bearing shifts. Now apparently the way to test this um, is to have a look at your oil pressure. Now I haven't got an oil pressure test gauge. I have got one coming. Royal Mail's got that along with my exhaust tubes that I'm still waiting on so I'm not sure when it's going to get here. Um, but apparently the way to tell is you stick the um, the pressure test gauge into a test port on the engine. I've had a look in the manual, I know where it is and everything. And you take a reading. Um, and it tells you, at, I think it's at 3000 revs, you have to take a reading and whatnot. Should be 2.8, if it's less than that, then basically the bearing has shifted, it's passing too much oil. Um, and it, it needs looking at basically. That I think is what's happened to the ZZR. But that fundamentally changes what I need to be doing next, in essence. Let's see if this fits. All right, you should go in there. Like that. Oh, it's looking good. I'll get a picture of this and I'll show it to you, but it's all in line with the frame. So this face here kind of comes out with the frame, if that makes sense. But it's the same width up here as it is down here as it is down there. Which is lovely. Right. So that's the bit that needs to be removable. Like that. So the idea is, is it'll have um, like a little lip sticking out, uh, no, the, the lip of this basically sticking out of there, which is going to sit to about there. All you've got to do is move it back five mil, which we can easy do. So real clear. And then the bugger comes out. <laughs> so I've just got to join it to this bit now. Right, uh, ZZR needs to come off the road. It needs to come off the road, it needs to get sorted. Um, but that kind of changes plans for what I need to get done. So, if he's coming off the road, the van needs to go back on the road. And I've got a whole list of stuff that I need to fix for when it failed its MOT. Um, the MOT is like an annual test vehicles go through that we got in the UK, if you don't know what it is. Um, and I've got a load of stuff that needs doing. So it's got a leaky shock. McPherson strut needs to be replaced because the bearing's gone on, on the top of that. There's um, the horn worked two of the three times he pressed it, so dodgy connection, dodgy horn, something like that. An indicator bulb needs to be changed. I've got a couple of ball joints that have got slop in them. You know, I mean, none of it is, is drastically hard. I've got a set of brakes down there that's been sat there for a year. I just haven't had a chance to put them on because I've been mucking about with bikes. <laughs> so anyway, I need to get all that work done. So not next week the week after i'll put in for holiday on the monday tuesday the thursday and the friday so start of the week i'll be having stuff off and seeing what i need and sourcing parts and all that sort of stuff and then during the rest of the week and the weekend or whatever i'll be putting it all back together so it's all ready for mot um but i, I really want to get the zzr off the road so i'm not causing any damage basically um and then once he's off the road, he's just going to get laid up and we'll sort him out later on. So that changes my plans slightly because I need to get that done. But then it also changes plans for the SRAD. And I was thinking about this anyway, if I'm honest. The SRAD is going to be a test bed bike. Initially, it was just going to be a case of set it up as a track day toy and just go hell for leather around the track. Because that way I can lean on any suspension changes I do and geometry changes and brakes, all that sort of stuff, and try and prove it in a harsher environment than the road. But I was thinking about it, and the thought occurs to me that I need to be able to prove it on the road as well. 
because ultimately that's what future project bikes are going to be based on. So once I've got all the geometry and everything else sorted, I can set my frame jig up to mimic it and then I can build a bandit style frame to mimic the SRAD frame and swing arm and all that malarkey. So we could end up with a bandit that actually handles. Because <laughs> the SRAD compared to this is mint. I mean, it's not as good as a modern day bike, but it's way better than that. So what I'm probably gonna end up doing, I think, is we'll get the van sorted. We're gonna get ASBO all done and dusted and finished. The next project will be the SRAD and I'm gonna set him up as a, it's gonna be a road going track bike basically, a street legal race bike. Um, but when I wanna go and take it to the track, I can just unbolt all the running gear, you know, the lights, the indicators, the number plate board, all that stuff will all just come off dead easy. Um, and uh, we've just got a track day toy, basically. That way I can prove stuff on track and on the road and make sure it's all cushy before we stick it on the next project. And the next project will handle, like properly handle. So that's what I'm gonna do. So the SRAD ultimately is gonna become my daily. Um, I think that's gonna be the way to go, if I'm honest. And it could be an awful lot of fun. I mean, the ZZR's brilliant, but you know, it's, it's a mile muncher. I'm, I don't need a mile muncher. I need something that's fun in the corners because I don't do long distance. You know, if I go out scratching, it's like an hour hooning through the lanes and yeah, you know, the coast road and all that sort of stuff. And this round would be a lot more fun doing that. So the s rad ultimately, it's gonna have a complete engine refresh and rebuild. Um, anything that needs changing will just get changed. Um, I'll be able to use it as a daily for a bit just to make sure that everything is fine and you know all that sort of stuff. And then we'll be selling him on and he's gonna fund the next project after the SRAD, which I kind of want to be a Bandit 12 because it's the same size lump as that, but a Bandit 12 in an SRAD geometry frame, same sort of size in that. I mean, that could be a hell of a keeper. <laughs> that could be a proper laugh. <laughs> right. What's next? Right, so I've just had the tank on him again because there's a void under the tank that I want to fill. Essentially, I want to try and use this space in here because it's dead space. I ain't going to be doing anything else with it. So I might as well use it for airbox. So um, I've had the tank on, just did an outline around the tank, and then I've stepped in about 40 mil because there's like a bracket and all sorts of other gubbins under there. I just want to make sure we got clearance. So I stepped in 40 mil and it takes me nicely up to, like an arc, nicely up to the inside of this, this frame rail. Um, and we can step up 50 mil, which is sort of to there. So the idea is we're gonna build a wall around this at a slight angle, and then basically go from there straight up here to this frame rail. It just means I can use that little void in there as well for extra volume for the air, air box. And I want to try and maximise as, as much as I can do. The only question I've got is how the bloody hell am I going to join them? how it's going to go. Um, above the airbox, I've still got a whole load of space. Loads of space. I've probably got 
80 mil, 80 mil, something like that, from the top of that flat bit to the underside of the tank. But that's what it's going to look like. You just got to imagine this bit is all filled in. Obviously, where I come down the side and up to the front. Um, if we have a look at the air box, or what is going to be the air box? Come on, off you come. Ooh. I think it's going to do the do. Um, there is a flange there that is obviously going to fix down onto this front piece. There's going to be a flange that runs all the way around the outside. Um, so I'll be able to get to the bottom of it underneath here. Um, I'll be able to get to the side of it in this gap. And just by taking the tank off, I'll be able to get to the top of it as well. So I'm pretty confident just like a little flange all the way around. Um, I'll probably fix it with like riv nuts or I might weld some bosses in or something like that. But I reckon that's going to work. So we could just have the tank off, have the seat off, undo that and that, the ones down the side, the ones at the bottom. This whole section will just like lift out if you wanted to at that point. Um, but it also means that the the air box will just slide out to the side and it will come out either side as well. So that, I think, is how I'm going to do it. And we just have these little rubber jobbies. Where are they? These things. They're going to be set into the air box at the front, into that groove. These are quite important because it's the like velocity stack or whatever, but the shape of them, the diameter, the height of them, it all sort of influences power and torque and all that sort of stuff. So I'm just going to reuse them. But I reckon that's what it's going to look like. Follows a nice shape there as well. It's sort of dished out a little bit. And if you were to put a line like straight edge down the frame, it's all in line that way, all, all the way along here. So I'm happy with that. Plus it gives me this little flat bit here. I could always mount something else on there should I need to underneath the tank, as, you know, because the tank's basically up to about here. I've still got daylight on top there, which could be a handy thing. Right then. Um, oh, I've got another toy. Let me show you. Right, so this is the bolster that I made for my fly press that you see sat in the corner. Um, basically, I can make different discs or put holes in here and I can put different tooling on it. Um, so, for instance, I've got a dimple die jobby. He's been used in this, all sorts of stuff. Um, but essentially it just means I can switch out this top bit um, and I can put different tooling in and use it in the fly press and I know it's all lined up and blah de blah de blah So I was going to be making a louver press. But then a very nice fella at work rocked up with this. Oh, look at that. It's a louver press look. Um, so I ain't got to make one, I'm just going to use this because that's 80 mil which is exactly what I want. Um, but it's all made out of tool steel. So I'm not going to have to slot it. This will basically shear it as well. Um, and it's also set up for two mil material. So uh, the way it works is this face engages with the back of this face on the front. Yeah. And there's a two mil gap all the way around the outside, which is where the material goes. And you just wind it down on the hydraulic press. This edge here is dead sharp. <clears throat> so that will shear it. And then this formal will just press it out into a louver. And once you've done one, you just move your piece of sheet back, put the leading edge of the louver you've just made on that back face, and you just get equal spacing every time. So I ain't got to make one. I'm going to use that one. Uh -huh. We'll have a play with this at some point. So that's it. I'm happy. I've got a plan. I think that's going to work. And I also think it's going to look really rather nice. Um, so all I've got to do now is... Um, stick in the side bits which I'll just take a measurement of how tall the thing is and I can cut out a side piece, you know, space it out on some card, cut out a side piece, tape it all in so the back half is separate to the front half and make sure it all just sort of fits up and then if that's the case that's what I need to make. There are quite a few bits to it, there are quite a few bits to it. Um, so it's probably going to take me a little bit of time actually. <laughs> But yeah, it'll be worth waiting for. It'll be a one-off. It'll do the do. I'm sure it will. Certainly it's big enough 
you look at the the volumes i mean mine mine is bigger but that back bit does kind of narrow up um where the filter goes but i reckon it's going to work all right so um if my steel hasn't turned up next week i'm going to start start making that i think um because i'm still waiting on the tubes with the exhaust though we're never going to deliver today because it's saturday and they're on strike so um i've already got the material to do this so what i'll probably do is take that home measure it all out get it all so it's you know symmetrical and blah -de blah -de blah um and start drawing out some templates and that, that i can start cutting some material with and we start tacking it together and see how we go that'd be all right wouldn't it so anyway i've got loads of cardboard everywhere i need yet another cleaning up but i'm not doing it today because it is now four o'clock i need to leave because i've got monster yorkies to make we're having a roast so anyway that's where i'm going to leave it for this one thank you ever so much for watching i do hope you're well and staying safe we'll see you on the next one Layers!